before we get into this episode, there's something that might be of interest that I wanted to tell you about. Seen and Heard, who uh, run this podcast, have been asked by Scotland Food and Drink to undertake a strategic review of the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards. Now, these Excellence Awards have been going for almost 20 years and are a huge mainstay of the food and drink sector. But it's time to ensure that they're still relevant. So if you have ever been involved in the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards, or even if you've ever had an opinion about them, we would love for you, please, to complete our survey. So if you go to the On Farm Twitter, which is at on underscore farm uk and click the link in the bio there will be a tab in there that will take you to the survey and it should only take you a very short while to complete but we would be enormously grateful This is somewhat of a novelty. We're on episode 14, which is the final episode of our series in association with the Royal Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland. And it is the first one where we've done any significant face-to-face uh, chatting. So it's it's nice, actually. We're obeying all of the relevant and current rules, but it's really nice to actually be able to look into people's eyes and have a proper conversation. So. I'm joined once again by Alan Laidlaw, the Chief Executive of RAS, and by Bill Gray, the Chairman. Gentlemen, 14 weeks has passed since we first had our discussions for the very first episode in this series. And at that point, obviously, cancellation of the Highland Show was extremely recent and feelings were were raw. Bill, I'll perhaps come to you first. Um, What's happened over those 14 weeks, first of all, in terms of your feelings and how they've kind of evolved and developed? Um, Thanks, Anna, and morning. Welcome to the marquee in our garden. So that's about as good as we can get, probably, for socially distant. Yeah, a lot's happened, actually, in in a a whole myriad of different ways. And you've, you've covered so much good ground on your podcasts with things like the virtual show uh, week that we had and then the, the DC Thompson P&J led Scottish agricultural show so from that point of view um, yeah quite a lot's happened you know from from a, a pretty horrible situation um, there's been some quite bright spots along the way um, doesn't take away from from the severity of the pandemic within the society a lot's happened obviously um, not much at Ingleson because Ingleson went into lockdown pretty much straight away and, and hasn't actually reopened yet um, as, as an open site. I, I guess now coming towards the end of that 14 week run of, of these podcasts, I'm starting to think a little bit about what the lockdown easing means for us and, and how we might buy into that. And it's really tough because um, I think I've said it before that, that we can make plans as much as we like, but ultimately um, if, if the first minister or one of her cohorts stands up uh, on a Wednesday or a Thursday and says something, the landscape all of a sudden changes again and what we might have planned suddenly becomes either not doable and there's been a few cases of that where we've tried to um, set up one or two small events, um, equestrian particularly, and to be told that they're not going to be able to be viable. Um, so yeah, so um, on the one hand a lot of time, uh, on the other hand actually we're, we're a good bit further down the road in terms of what we think we might be able to do but actually that's not clear at all. In all seriousness, you you have been as busy as you would have been had there been a show, taking care of the team and the staff. How did that go? That you know, that's these things are new to twenty twenty. They're never going to replace the real thing, and but they would never intend to or hope to. But how do you feel feel that it went? I, I think for for what it was, and and you're absolutely right. Nothing will replace that buzz that you get when when the show's actually on and you're there in person. I think it went really well, actually. Uh, the rep team particularly put a fantastic uh, virtual extravaganza together. Um, the Scottish Farmers um, Champion of the Decade caught uh, quite a bit of imagination, although it wasn't strictly part of that week, but it was all happening about that same time. Scottish Young Farmers and QMS obviously you know, did things around about that week as well. We were able to run our Technical Innovation Awards. We had the best entry we've ever had, which um, I'm hoping will be repeated next year when we're ho- hopefully back on site. Um, because you don't want to do it too well. You don't want to sort of say that, you know, this is actually better than the norm. But uh, it was great that, that um, we got that up and running. And, and I know that the uh, the, the people who um, entered that um, got a lot out of it. So, yeah, so I, I think I think a lot of good has come from it. I think the teams did a great job. That The Scottish Online Agricultural Show caught the imagination. But I think the biggest thing from our point of view, and certainly for me personally, was the fact that the love of the show 
just erupted, I think, during that week. You know, we'd all talked about the fact there wasn't going to be a show and how horrible it was going to be and all the rest of it. It wasn't until we hit that Thursday that the show would normally have started. My phone started ringing, social media went bonkers, and that carried on right the way through that week and actually probably right the way on into the social media stuff that we did for the, the online agricultural show, which was a couple of weeks later. And that hasn't stopped. And, and that's hugely heartening and humbling, really, for us, I think, just to realise, you know, what the show means to people and, more importantly, what the lack of the show means to people and, and the effect that that's had. Alan, you'll have noticed this in particular. You, ne- you need things like that in a time like this to keep morale up amongst showgoers, people who were feeling sad on the Thursday of the show because they couldn't go, but also amongst your team. You know, they, they work so hard for 12 months and then this year there was no show so they need things like the enormous support for, for Rhett for example to, to kind of keep going and make them feel as enthused as ever would you say that's that's true yeah absolutely Anna I think um, Bill mentioned around the build-up around the time to the show normally that there's a we talk about a roller coaster and and in, in January February that roller coaster leaves the high spots and we can scream and shout and you know the show happens in June whether we like it or not if we're ready you know that happens and this year it didn't for me through this period to hear in other people's voices how much it means to them is a real highlight you know and, and different people's voices whether it be Robert Taylor from Galbraith talking about how important it was for for business. We managed to get our foot in the door in a prime location behind the grandstand and we would not miss the Highland show for all the tea in China. Or the Runciman family which were a hoot and actually brought a real passion for the show and for showing and shows and farming and breeding together. What's a kiss party Rocket? After a big win at the Highland, what, what's the kiss party like? The kiss party is just uh, having uh, drinks together within your breed and you can get a blether and you can uh, criticise the judge and you can... Uh, you can Compliment sim- the judge. Sympathise with the judge. <laughs> The kiss part is get them keep the breeds together. You know, to sit back and reflect on that during a time that we were frustrated was brilliant. But to hear people saying, the Royal Highland Show means a lot to me. It means a lot to my family. It's a huge part of our lives, our business, or it's a huge part of our social peace, whatever it is. That, truly humbling, I think, from, from that perspective. I, I totally agree, Alan. And I think the other thing that, that highlighted that for me was that um, you know RSABI had been running their hashtag keep talking campaign for probably a month before that leading up towards the show and actually focusing on the show and then you know we um, we offered them the, the sort of uh, hashtag phone five option for the f- for the week of the show and try and encourage people to phone each other and I was blown away talking to people about how many people had actually picked that up and actually it was an opportunity for them to engage with each other the loss of opportunity for people to get together is is the key thing, and that's that was the probably of all the things. Um, you know, we took a massive financial hit for lack of income, etc., etc., etc. But in this current pandemic time, particularly, the lack of that opportunity to get together, I think, was was probably the biggest miss of the lot. I think you're dead right, and and you know we did a an episode focused on the social connection of the show, but actually every episode has been about the social connection of the show, whether it's about equestrianism, whether it's about showing livestock, whether it's about business. Somebody in every episode has said it's about meeting people, it's about seeing people I perhaps don't see for a year. And I think I think RSABI and what you did to, to connect with that was, was phenomenal. I actually have an uncle who used to be a show director and he was on over 40 people that he'd been phoning since the campaign. So people really took it to heart. Uh, and, but I think they needed to because there were people at home who were feeling down and who needed that lift, and I think that's that's been really important. Absolutely, one of our um, one of our vice presidents actually um, during one of the board meetings that we had, and we were talking about this very point that you know that lack of getting together um, was, was was such a thing that, that people were missing, and uh, he said actually it's it's almost akin to to grieving, and he said you know it's very difficult to make that sound sort of not severe because you know obviously grief is, is, a, is a hugely big emotion but but actually there was an element of that, that that people were just at a loss because the show wasn't there and i think bill you're absolutely right there from a membership perspective people people can take things for granted you've been a life member for the society for 40 years you've been to the show you know you've only missed one or whatever and it's only when it's not there 
and it's only when regional shows are not there and the opportunity to catch up informally that you start looking around saying hey that that third week in June is really important to me to myself to the family to the business and I miss it and that means a lot to me and I think you know we know how important the show is to people when we hear it anecdotally but to hear that regularly and so regularly as we have done over the last couple of weeks in particular really reminds us why we do what we do why the society was founded why it's important that we support rural scotland in every way that we can whether that's a nuffield scholar or you know the showing of livestock or the technical innovation awards and we want to make sure that in 230 years time whatever it looks like you know the the podcast equivalent of the day has somebody like monty asking somebody like bill you know what do you think you guys in 2020 would think of this that's my job to work with the board is to make sure that we are sustainable going forward and, and build touched on our losses you know it's been a really tough year we're not going to have an easy spell for the next week while and there's never been a, a better time to sort of get in behind us so to put it bluntly alan um if somebody's listening and um, what what can they do to, to support the society you know they'll, they'll hopefully they'll come along to the show next year and we'll talk about what the show might look like in 2021 but what what can they actually do right now to, to contribute and to make sure that the Highland Society remains as, as strong as ever it's a really good question and I think we're working on a fundraising campaign in the past the society has managed its own resources through different means and and we've tended to fundraise to to buy cattle stalls for the the new Highland Hall in the early 2000s or for fundraising for the new members building. We're going to have to become a more regular fundraising organisation for the next few while and, and we can't be bashful about that. We've got a lot of debt now that we would rather not have in, in terms of what's happened in COVID and we would want to be able to fundraise to f- allow us to continue those activities, to allow us to support RSABI, to allow us to support young farmers and Nuffield scholars and, and to really put money back into RET and to develop there because actually, you know, A lot of people are talking about what the crisis has done for farming and it has made people realise where their food comes from. It has made people realise how much they value their outdoor spaces, the wild landscapes of Scotland, tourism and things like that. And the society and agriculture in rural Scotland is so important to all those. So we will be fundraising and we will be asking for, for members to support us. We will be asking the public who probably have just turned up to the show to, to help us as well and, and to think about how much they value that and to help us make sure that we've got all the opportunities, you know, restrictions prevailing next year to put on a barnstorming Royal Highland show in 2021. I think we've been trying to highlight as much as we can that it's not just about the four days of the show we are a large charity um, we're, we're, we have a charter which requires us to carry out charitable work any charity will fundraise my last soundbite I think on the end of my last podcast was as somebody said once you know if you had more to give would you give more well the answer obviously is yes at the moment we need some assistance because we're we're, we're, we're on a harder time we, we've got challenges ahead Alan mentioned that you know, the, the perfect storm arrived with all the infrastructure work that we've done with the new members pavilion that we've built. We had a programme of, of seeing how that would pan out over the next wee while and, and, and return us to surplus. And then the pandemic comes along and, and all of a sudden um, the perfect storm arrives and, and we're, we're left in a difficult situation at the moment. From my perspective, Anna, it's it's about us being honest around that. So lots of people are interested in the reporting of the annual results and, and things. And, you know, we are going to make a substantial loss this year. And as Bill said, with more, we can do more. That is about people thinking about if they can can help and, and, and donate or support or sponsor. Or, because ultimately, that feeling of loss around the show we don't want there to be any risk on future shows we want as long as covid is allowing us to do what we want to do we want to to do as much as we possibly can but next year there might be some restrictions in place that means it's more difficult to do or there's more costs involved in the royal Howard show we're just being honest about that that with more financial resources the society can recover faster do more and have a, a greater impact for for all of our members in rural scotland and I think there's an opportunity at the back of COVID once we're, we're past the, the worst for rural Scotland to bounce really forward from this and to recover. But to do that, it has to have good organisations. And RAS is one of those organisations that quietly helps other organisations, whether financially, with networks, with facilities at Ingolston, with the Royal Howland Show as an opportunity for them to, to come together or a place for Agri-Scott to happen. 
and all these things need to be supported as a as a web we all work together and we all do that quietly and and i think now's the time for ras to be reasonably bold about say you know we have an impact on lots of different organizations in scotland and we want to continue that impact to be as high as possible and that's just got me thinking actually because in last week's episode we heard from lorraine who is one of the staff members at rsabi obviously she was she was reminding everybody that that helpline is part funded by ras which some people maybe don't know uh, or didn't know until now and she was also saying that the calls that they put out so they will phone people who are perhaps feeling lonely or just in need of a chat or somebody just to to give them a call each day and make sure they're up and about and and getting on with the day-to-day business and those calls that they're putting out have doubled since covid i say a lot of the calls have been emotional though People have suffered bereavement during COVID, you know, and they can't really see their family and attend funerals. Or with lockdown, there's been a lot of family issues. So we have a mediation that we offer and, you know, encourage families to sit down and chat. Yeah, it's been a tough time for everybody. That's just one example of, of an organisation that, that RAS helps and, and that we would all be lost without. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's exactly right. You know, our support to our SABI is, is directly to that helpline element of, of their charitable business. We don't know exactly how the Highland Show will look in 2021, but I think many people listening to this will be itching to be there, obviously, for many reasons. But one of the reasons I think they'll be itching to see the new members' pavilion. Now, I know this is a podcast, so we can't really show photos, but can you describe it in any way for us to, to get people to understand what they, they'll hopefully be seeing next year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I left Ingolston, we had just finished it and we had got handed the keys the day before lockdown. We locked the door and we walked away. And, you know, Bill and I are both wincing as we say that. And, you know, the day we took the decision to to cancel the show, Bill went, I, I, I suggested Bill went for a walk and he walked around the new building and I think got even more frustrated. Um, so when I left Ingolston at lockdown, the, the, the sort of earth was bare um, and the building was finished and looked great. When I went back a number of uh, months later, you know, the grass had bedded down, the maintenance team had cut the grass and the building really found its place in the showground. It sits exactly where the McRobert Pavilion was with that beautiful view over the main ring, sat beside those mature trees. And it's a a building that's been designed to be far more open than the old building and, and in the round. So there's a terrace right round it so you can walk around the whole building You've got southern sun on the on that element near Eggleston House and then you've got the vista over the main ring. It's really bright and airy because there's a load of glass in it. Um, we've spent a lot of money to and time making sure the acoustics work well. Um, and it, when you walk into that building, there's actually a, a real sense of, of entrance and calm. But also, I think everyone who comes in there who's been to the Royal Island Show just looks around and goes, what a great place to be with your friends and family. And you can see that that palpable buzz to the west side is the bar and most people who go to the Royal Island Show who are members and who've participated in that will go and lean against the bar and there's an elbow sort of perched on the bar with pride to say this is where I want to be and we are so excited about getting people in there um, yeah, and, and there's a real sense of frustration that it was on time, on budget, looking cracking and not be able to be enjoyed uh, at the show this year and, and I think the key for me would be you know, we want to get people in there soon um, and we certainly want to fill it uh, next June we've, we've designed it for people coming together to share you know, stories and, and experiences about rural Scotland I, I would actually challenge anybody not to walk into it and, and not go, wow, <laughs> this is something else. It's absolutely everything we wanted it to be, um, probably and more, actually. It's a hugely flexible event space as well as a member's um, place to come together during the show. You'll sense my frustration when I say we were looking forward not only just to showcasing it at the show, we were looking forward to hosting a wedding in it in May, we were looking forward to setting it up as, as a centre for debate and, and conferences and lectures. And we had a, a reasonable rollout programme of, of things. More than SAC, yeah. um, NFUS, Scotland Food and Drink, all those organisations oh, we talk about well, all wanting to be there. What a place to have on our doorstep, you know, that we can come and, and utilise. And and, um, and actually, to me, that then goes a little bit further than that because I firmly believe that as a society or as the society, you know, we have a, we have a place 
Um, sorry, we've got some noises off here. I think it's a cow actually at the next door farm. <laughs> Going back to that whole point about about the society and, and its position, I would love to see the society as, as being um, right at the hub of, of all of the organisations that are stakeholders with us. You know, we've already mentioned RSABI, we've mentioned Scottish Young Farmers Clubs, we've mentioned um, Scotland Food and Drink, for example. You know, it would be fantastic if out of all of this, a real desire for everybody to realise that, that being being with a common purpose, and, you know, we don't all have to have exactly the same purpose, but that whole common purpose of making sure that what happens in rural Scotland and in agriculture in rural Scotland um, continues to move forward and, and continues to add value. Yeah, I think that coming together for people, a number of people have said, you know, be careful the first show out the box when, uh, when lockdown releases because it's going to be an absolute belter. We certainly hope it will be. We're absolutely focused on that at the moment as, as being um, our, our primary focus. The, the events, opportunities towards the end of the year are diminishing every time we have a pushback on phase three or four or whatever. But yeah, so the focus is very much on, on 2021 show and, and beyond. It's very easy to focus on, on something near, but from the society's point of view and from the show point of view and that support that we need, you know, we've got to look further ahead. 2022 is the 200th anniversary of that first show um, back in Queensbury House Gardens in 1822. We still are planning to hold the, um, the Golden Shears World Shearing Championships that year as well. So if there's ever going to be a big show, that, that's the one. And let, let's hope that 2021 gives us that springboard to, to leap forward and, and, and continue the, the great work that the society does and that bringing together of everybody. Absolutely. And, and meantime, so Alan, I, I know there are many uncertains, but as you say, you're, you're for, I forget the word you use, but you're certainly forging ahead uh, with vigour towards 2021. It can't be easy. There must be frustrations. Um, but can you maybe give us a bit more detail on, on what you're kind of currently talking about? Yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of scenarios out there. Scottish Government and Scottish Enterprise have done some scenario planning and we've spent a lot of time as a team, whether it be the staff team uh, or the board, looking at those. What can that help with? What can it challenge? What what does it make more difficult? Bill's been really clear that we are absolutely committed to delivering a Royal Highland show within the guidelines, within whatever restrictions happen. There's some people that are chatting there to say the Royal Highland show will not happen because the society aren't going to invest in it absolute nonsense we will continue to do everything in our power everything with the support of the members to put on the royal highland show next year the year after and for many years after that and um, we'll be looking at whether there's uh, restrictions on on tickets to be only one day rather than any day so we can track and trace we'll move more digital and um, we might have some isolation areas and some uh, some checking we're engaging with Events Scotland and the whole events industry to check about how you make events as safe as possible um, right the way through. Um, we're looking at different options for segregation of certain areas of the show. You know, ultimately, not everybody wants to spend time, you know, in certain parts of the show. Some people love going to the question area, but don't like going to the livestock area. So we'll work on all of those. You talked about the frustration. The frustration is we just don't know. And we, we need to spend time usefully making sure that those plans are robust. So, um, we, you know, we might have to delay um, some announcements because actually we don't know the format of the competitions because there'll still be restrictions. But what we'll do and what we promise to do is keep talking to our members, keep talking to our trade stands and our stand holders and our stakeholders to make sure they're part of that. Because the one thing for, for anyone is that we we provide the, the framework and we provide the site and we provide the, the buzz, but it's about those people that you've spoken to over the last 14 weeks, Anna, that make the show. And we need them all to be there next year um, and the year after. So I think we'll be doing everything we can. We might have to do things differently as we have over the last few months, and we just ask for people's help with that. And if you've got an idea that how you could do something different, don't be scared to, to come forward. Just don't come forward in May, because planning of the Royal Highland Show for 2021 is already well underway. There's lots of work happening. And actually, there's been a, there's been a little silver lining to the cloud of COVID is it's actually allowed us internally in the society to change some of the systems, IT and, and programs that we use 
onto new systems because normally the gap between shows is so tight to have that that work done and so there are benefits that will come you know we're moving more online than we've been in the past and that's hopefully a signal for everyone that we are absolutely serious committed and, and heartfelt um, intent on delivering next year's Royal Highland Show. Just to, to pick up on that, I think the, the frustration we've got at the moment is the uncertainty. Nobody likes uncertainty. Um, we as, as agricultural people are, are used to it, I guess, because I was likening it to sending grain away without knowing what you're going to get paid for it. So, you know, we're, we're used to that in some respects, but it doesn't help to solve the frustration or, or ease the frustration that, that 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 brings. The uncertainty means that we're going to have to spend a lot of time and money to see what format and what shape it might take, uh, um, but within the guidelines, and because we don't know what the guidelines are likely to be, you, you can see the dilemma that we're in. Um, uh, but, you know, we will move heaven and earth to do something, there is no doubt about that. And, and from the society's point of view, I think the other thing perhaps to mention um, is, is that in all of these crisis situations, the pandemic crisis, for example, that we're in at the moment, and there have been, you know, the 2008 financial crash and, and um, you know, affected a lot of businesses, a lot of people. That's going to affect us. But what it's actually made us do is look at ourselves quite closely and quite sharply and put into focus what we can do better. So, yeah, so, you know, um, on the one hand, a bit of realism. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, we have to remain optimistic and we have to remain enthusiastic and we have to remain forward looking. The guys in the Tontine Tavern in 1784 were looking forward. Um, the, the board of directors from 2020 into 2021 are looking forward. So um, I think it's pretty much the same. And what was encouraging for me is that unlike the last time we all chatted, which was virtually, um, today I can see the whites of your eyes and I can tell how determined you both are. So that's given me heart and, and I'm really looking forward to 2021 as a result. I'd like to thank you both for today, but also for, for all of these 14 episodes. We have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed working with RAS. You've been amazing to work with and you've helped us to uncover some of the some of the most passionate and enthusiastic voices among Scottish agriculture who we've heard from across the last 14 episodes. So thank you very much for supporting On Farm, the podcast. And I imagine the two of you have got uh, many people that you'd like to thank um, publicly um for for having supported the society and you as individuals throughout this process so alan uh, the floor is yours i could come up with an oscar style speech where i just list you know everyone off but no i mean the on farm i wouldn't i wouldn't cry i wouldn't start sobbing that was the first pod um <laughs> i think the on farm team have been brilliant anna you monty and dave dave's guided us behind the scenes you've done a great job of making uh, our incoherent ramblings sound a lot better Katrina Barclay's done a really good job of pulling content together. For me, the staff team throughout this have been brilliant, but it's the community, it's the members, it's the, it's the trade stand holders, it's the sponsors, it's it's everyone who shows livestock. And that support, genuinely, we've had some dark days in the last few months, that support has been real, committed and regular. Uh, and for that, I'm hugely grateful. And uh, hopefully we can re repay that to all of them. So, yeah, we've we've had a good spell and, and you know, keep getting involved. I, I, you know, I've since day one in the society, it is a membership organisation. And I, you know, the, the most buzz I get is out of people coming up with ideas. So thank you for those who do. And, and please thank you in advance for those who will come up with new ideas for us. I would just like to to totally reiterate um, Alan's Alan's comments there. Um, you know, we we've we've been humbled and heartened by all the messages of support that we've had. First and foremost, from our membership, um, no question. You know, um, we're true to our roots as a membership organisation. Without those members, you know, we would not be the organisation that we are at the moment. Um, there's no question about that. Alan's obviously touched on on all of those stakeholders that surround us and all those people who interact with us, particularly over showtime. You know the, the the continued support from our exhibitors and our trade stand holders and sponsors. And, you know we must mention RBS in specific terms because of, of their forty year plus support now of of the of the show and the society. From my point of view, I would I would like to um, my director board um, have, have been tremendous through all of this. You know a really tough task in, in trying to help guide the society through a, a, a difficult time and support Alan and the team who are doing a great job back at. I'm going to say back at Ingleson House, but they've not been back at Ingleson House. They've been um, all over the place. Those who've been working at home. Um, 
I'd like to thank you, uh, you guys, um, because um, I was not a podcast listener before this all started. And I guess what it's done, it's, it's actually opened up another avenue for people to understand what we do. Uh, you know, you, you've, um, I think, done a great job in sort of portraying lots of different aspects of what uh, the society touches and gets involved in. Um, I particularly enjoyed, I uh, didn't enjoy the first one quite so much because I got a slightly raw feeling back to uh, back to the, the cancellation of a show, which I guess is where, where we all started with this. But I, I really enjoyed walking around with Monty last week. The, the best moment of that, and, and thank Monty for, for his time, and I've known Monty for a long time, obviously local local to here with Dalkey's show, etc. He was followed me as chairman at Dalkey's show, um, was, was our discussion about the, the painting of, of the livestock and, um, you know, how, how painters of those days had poetic licence. Isn't it quite peculiar how stock were painted in those days? When people like, you know, Catherine McGregor or the Scottish farmer photographers, etc., make such an effort now to capture the exact likeness of, a, of, a, of an animal. Well, you're assuming that's the case. But of course, we weren't around in 1840 to know if that's exactly what it looked like or not. You know, we're looking at an Ayrshire cow here who looks more like a, I don't know, a beef animal on stilts, really. Quite short legs, very deep chest, no sign of ribs at all across the back, carrying a huge amount of flesh. We have to assume, I dare say, that these are accurate. That actually was quite an interesting thing. When we saw Major Walter's um, Nessie, which we'd had commissioned sitting next to it, and my comment, to, to uh, which I enjoyed and got Monty chuckling, was that, you know, maybe in... 200 years' time, they'll be looking or back and saying, is that what a Charlie used to look like? <laughs> so, yeah, time moves on. But, um, no, I think it's been great, and, and I'd like to thank everybody that's picked up on, on these podcasts because I think it's been a, a great vehicle for, for informing people about what we do and, and uh, engaging with that community that surrounds us. So, yeah, many thanks. No, you, you're welcome. Thank you. I, I, mean, I think something useful to point out, actually, is that podcasts stick around for a very long time if you know somebody who hasn't listened yet of course it's not too late you can start listening to these 14 episodes tomorrow or you can start listening in six months time they, they will be here and and we hope that they provide a bit of an archive for RAS but also that, that as I say people can listen at any point that's that, that's the whole point it's convenience so thank you once again to Bill and Alan and thank you to the Royal Highland Society for working with On Farm over the last four months. Before we sign off, we're going to bring Monty in for a final few thoughts. Hi, Monty. Hi, Anna. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, good. it's quite sad this is the last episode, isn't it? I know. I feel a bit emotional, actually. It's been, it's been amazing and it's been really inspiring because... Everybody we've spoken to, even those people who've faced really tough times, have have had a kind of silver lining to their cloud and they've been amazing at kind of dealing with these circumstances. So I feel quite uplifted by what we've heard. I tell you what, it's been very, very interesting, hasn't it? Actually taking part, actually speaking to people and hearing them talk about the Highland Society, the Highland Show, what it means to them, it's really fired me up in terms of what it all means to me personally too. Things like, I don't know, Johnny Watson, Johnny's a, a well-known business figure, his comments about um, about the show and what it means, very poignant. It's the greatest agricultural show in the UK by far. And there's a bit of style, there's a lot of fun. And it's always easier doing business with people when they're feeling positive and in a in a good place not standing in the steading with the rain driving at you both desperate to get on with life it's a special occasion and i would say it really got a very special spirit speaking with penny from sayfc about about young farmers moments it is that sort of that interaction ongoing not just that sort of four days of the highland show and it's fun it's fun as well isn't it it's social and <laughs> yes. it's fun personally remember back to my young farmers days and the show circuit and if we didn't have a local show we'd be looking to another one to go to every weekend of the year if we could yep yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely definitely suddenly i realized this affects me just as much as it affects the people i'm speaking with if that makes sense yeah that to totally makes sense and and what i found particularly interesting is 
meeting and I say meeting because it's, it's we're meeting them across zoom most of the time but I've loved meeting new people who I've never met before and hearing their stories but actually just as moving has been hearing the people who I already know talk so for example the farrier who we had in the equestrian episode he is my farrier so I've known him for years once I started to probe him and get all of the information out about everything that he does I discovered I didn't know all this information before it's also been really Amazing to see the Scottish Farrier team develop. The Highland Show offered us the forge as a sort of permanent home for the Scottish Farrier. So yeah, we have a, a great depth of horseshoeing skills in Scotland. And like I say, the Highland Show is definitely a, an integral part of that. Again, when you actually start to, to hear in detail about what they do and why they do it and why they're passionate about what they do, it's, it's particularly moving, I think. Particularly, in my mind, going to speak with uh, the Runciman family at Alan Shaw's was, was fantastic fun. The first year I won the, 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 the Chivix at the Highland Show, which was in 2009, there were one of the, the sheep stewards came up to me and said that... Uh, the Queen would like to meet you. I honestly thought he was pulling my leg to start with, but lo and behold, he wasn't. Which is a big honour, a big honour to to shake hands and meet her like. And she's uh, she was very nice to speak to and very easy to speak to. And uh, she knew her stuff. And was she as honoured to meet you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> These are, these are people who, yeah, you, you've known a long time, but it's it's just, it's lovely to, to, to have the, the sort of chat that we did with them. It'd almost be quite funny to make an episode, almost a behind the scenes type thing of us, actually what we've had to jump through in terms of Zoom and how we've recorded these remotely. And, you know, for example, the, the episode we did about about awards, wasn't it? Producer Dave wanted um, sheep sound effects in the background and obviously we were talking about clipping and actually I was recording while we were in the, the sheep shed, the clipping shed. My, my wife Moira was helping, she had the, the mic and she was trying to catch all the, the sound effects. All that had to be recorded while we were silent. Now that's quite hard when you're dealing with 300 sheep coming up a ramp, let me tell you. One, one I remember is when one of our participants or interviewees, who I won't name, messaged me just about five minutes beforehand saying I'm just I'm just perfecting my makeup for your podcast and and I had to say to her we do, you do realize that it's just audio we just want to hear your voice you're not going to be videoed and oh she said I have no idea she said I thought I, it was all going to be videoed <laughs> so I think she was relieved when she discovered the truth but uh, we've had yeah we've had a fair few funny moments Ever since I started my career in the agricultural industry, I've always thought that Scotland's stories need to be told. And and then I became aware of podcasting and became a, a bit of a, a fan and, and listened to many. And, and I just had this thought that actually this is exactly what Scotland needs. Scotland needs its rural stories to be told in a new way to reach new people, but also to allow you know people to to have options in terms of how they, they listen and learn more about what goes on in the countryside. So that's kind of where the idea for On Farm came from. And we've realised our ambitions and we've been going since January. It's been amazing fun. We've told umpteen rural stories. Uh, we're all about positivity but realism at the same time. And I want us to still be here in 10, 15, 20 years' time when podcasting is totally mainstream what will happen is that more and more people will join the podcasting movement. And I can't wait because I think it's a fabulous way to get these amazing stories out there for people to listen to. I would just add to that that what we've set out to do, and I hope what listeners think we've achieved, is be really, really professional in this. We have got a super chap guiding us in all of this, um, and Dave, our producer behind the scenes, does an excellent job in putting this together and turns out what I believe is a really professional 35 to 45 minute podcast and I hope the listeners agree that there's not a lot to rival that certainly in terms of, of, of rural podcasting and, and, and rural Scotland. Yes I, I agree uh, you know Dave 
has many, many years of experience at the BBC. I know he's going to cut this bit out. Nobody ever hears Dave's voice on this podcast, but it wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for Dave. He is our, our true expert here, and he is the reason that these podcasts sound so good. We chose to go down the professional route because I think people deserve to have that when they're listening to these amazing stories, and, and I think it's, it's, it's paid off. And thanks to the, the way it's been done, and thanks to the contributions from the Royal Highland Society and everybody else who's taken part in our podcasts you know, up to now, they have enabled us to gain what's actually quite a powerful position Because we're in the weekly routine for hundreds of farmers. They listen to our podcast. They've got it on auto download and it's there every Monday morning for them to listen to. We've got a direct line straight to these people. So I guess anybody who's listening who has a business or a brand that they think would benefit from sponsoring on farm or working in association with us like RAS have done, please get in touch. You know, we've we've got the ability now to share your messages and, and effectively we're a direct line straight to the hundreds of farmers and rural people, other rural people who've been listening to On Farm over since January when we, we started. Yeah, there's there's an opportunity here for anyone who would like to work with us to make a podcast and tell their story. A podcast gives you 35 minutes of, of depth of content and I think that's so valuable. So if there's a a project story that needs to be told or a family story that needs to be told or a product that needs to be described. Podcasts, you can do that in a way that that other mediums just simply can't. So I think that's what it's about. It's about telling proper stories in an easily digestible way that everybody can understand and enjoy. So if we can carry on doing that, and as Monty said, we will need partnerships, you know, to enable us to do that. Um, But if we can carry on doing that, I'll certainly be happy. We can reach the audiences. You would benefit from having your brand associated with Own Farm. If you are an organisation who wants to reach a rural audience, if you're an organisation, a company or someone with a story to tell, if you want to get in touch about how you might be involved, please do. Monty, um, you you missed out on meeting Jim Smith. He is absolutely hilarious and and a fantastic ambassador for for Scottish farming so we've decided haven't we to to play the Jim Smith episodes over again because we're taking a break we're not going to leave the airwaves quiet so we're going we've got the next two weeks we'll be reissuing uh, the episodes with Jim Smith just want to say thanks for tuning in and taking a minute of your day and listening to the podcast about farming and telling jokes like you can. It's been brought here on up in the farm like you can. A bit brings a bit of glamour to the lambing field like you can. Oi, oi. Floss! Floss! That <laughs> dumb dog. Spot on. <laughs> <laughs> After Jim Smith, we're returning to the batch lady who is uh, oh, internationally famous nowadays. Uh, she's got a book out, but she hails from the borders. Uh, lovely, lovely down-to-earth lady who we met just before lockdown. Everybody always comments that I um, always wear a white shirt yes, when I cook. Yes, that's brave. Yeah, <laughs> it's because I have a white shirt thing going on. Do you know, it's blue jeans and a white shirt uh, means I'm the batch lady. If I wear yes. anything else, I feel like myself and I lose my confidence. Thank you, everybody, for listening over the last 14 weeks. Uh, as I say, we'll be back properly uh, in about a month's time. But uh, meantime, enjoy the, the reissue of the episodes. And Monty, if you've got any final farewells to say... No, I mean that that that's kind of that's it from me really. That's it from me and bye for now. Goodbye everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>